Well, good evening and welcome to you all to this service of Choral Evensong. Welcome to you in church and to those of you who are online as we come together to worship our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We have an awful lot uh, of really exciting stuff in this service, including the choir anthem, that lovely anthem, Blessed Be the God and Father by Samuel Sebastian Wesley, which the choir will sing towards the end of the service. Well, there's plenty before that. We're still in the Easter season, and the Easter season is a time of rejoicing. The death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, the new life that he brings is wonderful for each one of us. And so, in the Easter season, I'm going to say the normal response and expect you to come back with some vigor. All right? Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Excellent. Our first hymn today, Ye Choirs of New Jerusalem. I'm going to say the minimum during this service and let it flow. Just occasionally I will intervene. All right, so let's stand and sing this lovely hymn together. Please be seated. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying, After me. Almighty and most merciful Father, 
We have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers, to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that do truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. sing Psalm 16.
first reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14, and this can be found on page 868 of the Pew Bibles. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God.
second reading is from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 15 to 25, and this can be found on page 1090 in the Church Bibles. John 21, 15 to 25. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Would you please stand as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Almighty God, who has given thine only Son to be unto us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life, give us grace that we may always most thankfully receive that his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavor ourselves to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And 
Now we remain seated while the choir sing the anthem, Blessed Be the God and Father by Samuel Sebastian Wesley.
Let's pray. Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither shalt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Heavenly Father, in this Easter season, uh, we thank you that we can rejoice in meeting in the living presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now as we look ahead uh, that you would speak your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm looking around, I think most of you have followed um, with us through Holy Week and Easter here at Rothley Church um, this year and followed with us uh, through John's Gospel and uh, reaching the climax of the uh, resurrection chapter, uh, chapter 20, the wonderful good news of the resurrection day as uh, told in John chapter 20. Um, we're now in that period where we're looking ahead to Ascension and to Pentecost. And I guess in some senses the temptation um, is for us to, as it were, uh, put John's Gospel back on the shelf and uh, pick up Acts, perhaps, and start looking forward to, as I say, Ascension and Pentecost. Um, I don't know about you, but when you read murder mystery books, um, one of the things I find frustrating sometimes is... Um, when you, you reach a, a chapter and the final revelation takes place, everything is solved and uh, you know who's done it and so on and so forth. And you're ready to put the book down and look for something else. And there's another chapter. You think, what's all this about? Um, why is there another chapter? Why do I have to read another chapter? And uh, uh, what's the point of it? Um, and so it is perhaps uh, with John's Gospel, um, with chapter 21. After all, chapter 20 ended with such a wonderful climax, that resurrection day. Um, the disciples visiting the tomb, Jesus meeting Mary, then in the upper room um, with Thomas, and a week later um, seeing Thomas, and Thomas declaring, my Lord and my God. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Full stop. Turn the page. Next book, please. But it's not. That's just the end of chapter 20. And we then have chapter 21 in front of us. And so this week, I've uh, been deliberately staying with this chapter, um, asking myself, why is it there? Uh, what does it have to add? And uh, in the past few days, I'm looking around, some of you um, have heard me talking about this already because I've shared words from this passage uh, with the residents at Mountview on Wednesday, uh, with our ministry team when we met together, and uh, with those meeting to plan our music for our services over the next month. So some people have already had their fill of my thoughts on John 21. But for those of you that haven't been walking with me through this week, um, let's just have a little look at the bit, um, particularly the part um, that uh, Sneha read for us. What is it all about? Well, the chapter begins with the disciples, Peter, Thomas, James and John and two others, have gone back to their day job, fishing on Lake Galilee. And if we even just pause a moment there, think about it. If that was it, that after the resurrection, the disciples had just gone back to their day job of fishing on the Lake of Galilee, would there be a church here in Rothley today? John tells us that this uh, occasion, he tells us in verse 14, was the third time after he was raised from the dead that Jesus had appeared to his disciples. And what he does in this chapter is he transforms their fruitless, fish, fruitless night's fishing into a huge abundance and then enjoys a breakfast barbecue on the beach. And when they'd finished eating, in verse 15, when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, isn't it actually when we've finished eating that significant conversations take place? I don't know if you had a Sunday lunch uh, today, 
the moment you finished your lunch? Did you immediately jump from the table and get on with washing up and clearing up? Or did you just put the knives and forks down and ever go, whew, and just begin a conversation? That's so often the way, I think. At the end of a meal, when the meal's finished, the significant conversations start to take place. The busyness of preparing the meal, sitting down, eating what's before us, maybe going back for seconds. But then we've all finished. We sit back and the conversation flows. And it's in the conversation that follows here we find the answer to the question, what next? And we see it in the story of the restoration and commission of Peter. You may remember the last words that John recorded Peter saying to Jesus were back in chapter 13, 37, at the Last Supper. Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Remember we then met Peter in chapter 18 in the high priest's courtyard three times vehemently denying that he was one of Jesus' disciples. What of Peter now? What is the future for Peter, having so badly let Jesus down? Is it just to go back to fishing? Perhaps some of us here are aware of having let Jesus down in various ways in our lives. What next? What do we go on to do? Well, here we see three times matching the three questions that the servant girl asked in the high priest's courtyard. Jesus probes Peter. Do you love me more than these? These not being the kippers and the buns, but these being the fellow disciples in front of whom Paul, Paul, Peter had so boldly declared, even if all fall away, I never will. Peter, do you love me more than these? You're the one that denied me, aren't you? Do you love me more than these? The second time, do you love me? Then a third time, do you love me? And just as in the high priest's courtyard, Peter became more indignant each time the servant girl asked him if he knows Jesus. So now Peter is increasingly and deeply hurt as Jesus asks his question three times. Challenging Peter, you said it before, do you really love me? In doing this, Jesus is clearly inviting Peter both to acknowledge what he had done, to acknowledge that however bold his words were, as Jesus had said, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So both to acknowledge what he had done, but also to recommit himself unconditionally and to find in Jesus now full acceptance and forgiveness. More than that, a welcome. I think this passage is a glorious, a wonderful, and a touching demonstration of Jesus knowing the secrets of our hearts, knowing the depths of our weakness, knowing what we long we could do, but also knowing how often we fail, and yet demonstrating compassion understanding, mercy, and forgiveness. I think as we look at this restoration of Peter, we too can take great encouragement from this. I'm sure for all of us, we can think of occasions when we know we've let Jesus down despite our best intentions, maybe publicly, maybe privately, Maybe by our thoughts, our words, our actions, as we said in the confession, maybe by our failure to speak or act for fear of being called to suffer alongside Jesus. If that is you, 
and I suspect it is all of us, may I encourage you to read this dialogue between Peter and Jesus and let it speak to your heart. Jesus, love, mercy, forgiveness and acceptance. But Jesus doesn't leave it there as if we were to say, okay, now we've dealt with that. Why don't you now get on with your fishing and carry on with your life and try not to do it again? No, instead he gives Peter, now restored and accepted, a mission. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. As Jesus prepares to ascend to the Father, he picks up here on his prayer in John chapter 17, verses 13 to 18. The finished word and the finished work of Jesus are now to be taken to the world. That's why there's a church here today. In his prayer for the disciples on that night before he died, Jesus asked the Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And here Jesus is sending Peter into the world. And the model in which he is to go into the world is as an under-shepherd of Jesus, to feed and to take care of the flock of lambs and sheep that are being gathered by Jesus year after year. Our choir have just sung a wonderful anthem which takes words which Peter was later to write. Uh, all the words of that anthem were taken from uh, 1 Peter. And in this we see how Peter understood what it meant to take care and feed the lambs. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. For you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the living and enduring word of God, the word of God that endures forever. That is the good pasture, the healthy food which Peter is to provide for the sheep and by which they are taken care of. It is the word of truth about the finished work and the teaching of Jesus. It is this word, this breath of God, that by the Spirit of God will give life to dry bones. Um, David and I have uh, spent the first two days of this week um, uh, locked away on a bishop's, uh, um, what's it called, bishop's council, that's right. And uh, one of the, there's always conversations about, you know, how can we grow the church, how can we grow the church in this way and that way and whatever. Absolutely right, we long to see the church grow but there is no silver bullet. There is no sil silver bullet. We have it here. It is in the mission that was given to Peter to take care of the lambs, to feed the lambs, to take care of the flock. It is to, basically, it is to love people, to pray for them, and hold out the living and enduring word of God through which we are born again, and through which we find that life that endures forever. That's the mission that Jesus gave Peter as someone who was forgiven and restored. And actually, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's our mission, every one of us today, as those who know that forgiveness, compassion, and mercy of Jesus, that we too, should love one another with a pure heart fervently. That we should pray for one another and that we should hold out to one another this living and enduring word of God. So how does it um, work out? Well, for Peter, Jesus says, this mission would lead to glorifying God through his suffering. For the Apostle John, we know it would lead to exile in old age on the island of Patmos. For both of them, it would lead to seeing that the 
uh, events of Jesus' life and the teaching of Jesus' life were written down in Scripture for us. We have John's Gospel here. And, um, and certainly only church tradition has it that uh, Mark's Gospel contains basically Peter's uh, teaching. And uh, we see in this passage that we may know this living and enduring word that was written by these apostles to be a trustworthy testimony from one who was a true witness of all of these events. So actually the gospel doesn't finish in chapter 20. It goes on from Easter Day. The story goes on. We too can know the depth of Jesus' love and forgiveness for us. We can be restored and reconciled to a loving relationship with him. And we, with this treasure of the apostles' testimony, uh, can both be fed ourselves and feed others as we seek to love and care for one another uh, within the flock, which is the church that God has called us to be part of. So let's pray. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for Jesus and pray that just as you took Peter and John and used them, Please take and use us in your service too. In Jesus' name, amen. If you follow the news overnight, you know that there's a lot that's happened across the world. So I'm going to begin our prayers with praying for the world, and it will seem like there's a lot to pray for, but I want to just encourage you to join with me in earnestly beseeching our Lord to intervene in these many situations across the world. So when I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we bring before you your beautiful world. We pray especially at this time for the situation between Israel and Iran and for all battling with fear, anger and thoughts of retaliation on both sides. We pray for peace to prevail and for a de-escalation of hostilities at a moment when tensions are running high. We also pray for the situation in Gaza and particularly for reports of looming famine in Gaza. We pray that aid will be able to get through to those who need it most and pray for the conflict there to be brought to an end quickly. On the first anniversary of Saddam's civil war, we pray for the millions living between starvation and death as a result of the war. We pray particularly for Médecins Sans Frontières, one of the last international humanitarian agencies still on the ground at Darfur, who are overwhelmed with the scale of need. Lord, we cry out to you for aid, relief, and hope to reach the millions who are difficult to get to and who the world seems to have largely forgotten. We also pray at this time for all affected in yesterday's killings at a Sydney mall. We pray for those grieving loved ones who have died and for those injured. We continue to bring the situation between Russia and Ukraine to you as well as all parts of the world where conflicts and wars still prevail and where people live in fear and are desperate for peace. Lord, we pray that you will restrain all bent on violence for your hope and strength to fill the hearts of all who are affected. We pray also for all involved in negotiations in these places, that wisdom will prevail and a commitment to save and preserve all lives will be made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church around the world. We thank you that many across the world have met or will meet today to worship you and serve in your name. 
We pray for clergy, ministers, and leaders in all churches who work to make your name known in the places where they serve. We pray for those areas of the world where those who follow you live in fear of their lives. Protect them, we pray. May they be strengthened and encouraged to trust and hope in you in the midst of great difficulties. We pray for the church in the UK and for our diocese. We pray for Bishop Saju and Martin as they lead churches in the diocese, as well as represent the people to the wider church. Give them wisdom and equip them as they work for you. We pray too for our church in Ropley, for Rob and Sarah, for all involved in leading worship here, and for all who serve in different ways. We continue to pray for the Minster Communities process rolling out across the diocese and for, in, for all involved in making difficult decisions for their churches at an uncertain time. We pray particularly that you will enable each church to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ at the center of their ministry and to increase focus on this. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our nation. Thank you for the access we have to education, health care, and the freedom to make choices. We pray for the continuing cost of living crisis affecting many around the country. We pray for the government and all who lead the nation. Give them wisdom to make the right decisions for the people. We thank you for food banks, social supermarkets, and charities. We pray for them as they work hard to provide relief to so many at this time. We pray too for those who are experiencing immense hardships, those whose mental health is greatly affected, and for young people across the nation facing unique struggles. We pray for the NHS as they continue to work to clearing waiting lists for those seeking essential treatment. And we pray for businesses who are struggling to operate in a difficult financial climate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Rofley and the communities we live in. We thank you for our homes, places of work, study and leisure. We pray for Rofley School, for Kate, the head teacher, the staff and children. Bless them, we ask, as they work hard to provide a place of education and security for all who come to them. We pray also for all the new estates that have recently been built and those in the process of being built around us. We pray for all the residents who live on these estates and those yet to move to the area. Help us to be a welcoming church, intentionally seeking to build relationships as new people come to the area over the next few months. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, Lord, we pray for all those known to us who are struggling. In a moment of quiet, let us bring to the Lord those we know personally who are facing difficulties at this time. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sneha. The strife is o'er, the battle done. Now is the victor's triumph won. Oh, let the song of praise be sung. Alleluia. Let's stand.
we do thank you for these gifts on this plate and for all those who give our bank accounts to your work here and abroad. We pray that the net product of that will be that people come to know you and deepen their faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit down. Just one or two notices, if I may. Firstly, most importantly, a great thanks to the choir, to Simon. Great stuff. It helps us to worship. It elevates our worship in a way that enables us to praise God. So we do thank you. It's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And we are grateful to you all. Next week, 9.30 morning service with choir and organ. 11 o'clock. Holy Communion with children's groups. On two Saturdays in June, there are concerts here in church on the 1st and the 22nd. It's all on the fellowship post. Do have a look. Um, be great to come along to them. You'll see some boxes filled for uh, sending to Ukraine over there. Love in a box. The deadline for sending these boxes is the 20th, Saturday the 20th of June. The church is open this week got June in here, but I'm wrong, aren't I? 20th of April. Yeah. Well, it shows you're awake, Rob. That was good. I thought you was. <laughs> yeah, this Saturday is the last day. All right. So, uh, yeah. Um, oh, I've got 20th of June. Oh, never mind. Um, there we are. So do, you know, it's great that so many have come. There might be one or two others who are able to, to give something um, for that wonderful, wonderfully good cause. Um, but I could be here all night, so I'm just going to say, read the fellowship post. There's tons of things in it. It's all good stuff. And not the prayer topics on the back page uh, against your fridge or somewhere where you're going to see them regularly. So I'm going to say the grace now, and then the choir are going to close the service with the sevenfold amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore.